like to call this meeting to order for the City Council meeting of July 21, 2020. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council Member Cordero. Council Member Motes. Here. Council Member Soto. Here. Council Member Waterfield. Here. And Mayor Patino. Here. So the first item on the agenda is a presentation. Um, Mr. Posada, good evening. So I'm happy to hear tonight and present uh, some recognition for our mayor's The mayor's team council is made up of uh, students from Santa Maria uh, and Pioneer Valley High School. Uh, they are usually active during the entire school year, uh, meeting on a regular basis with the mayor and with our staff to, uh, to put together programs and services. So what I'd like to do real quickly is, is recap kind of what they've been up to. Maybe. I don't know. All right. Thank you, Beth. So uh, tonight we're recommending that, that the council recognize the 14 graduating seniors uh, in appreciation for their civic engagement and dedicated contributions to the city of Santa Maria through their participation in the Mayor's Team Task Force. Some of the projects that the teens have been involved in, uh, they were uh, substantially responsible for the distribution of 1,100 uh, bus passes for students last summer. Uh, that helped get the kids around town to different venues. Uh, they also worked on a, developing a safe streets plan which was a student-driven plan that we're going to be presenting to the uh, Public Works Department. Uh, these are routes that the students typically take from uh, their homes to schools and other important venues, uh, trying to identify safe routes for the, for the youth to use along the way. One of the components of this program that we're still working on is trying to work with neighborhoods to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to solicit volunteers to be those uh, uh, vetted safe homes along the route and if a child needs some help that those homes would be identified along the way with some kind of signage uh, that would indicate that, that that's a safe streets home. So the expansion of team programming, programming was something else that they were, were involved in. The Mayor's Teen Council uh, ideas have been applied towards expanding our programming. Uh, in the neighborhoods. Uh, teens without transportation to the youth center uh, can still receive uh, recreation services through what we're calling pop-ups. Uh, the staff and our team volunteers would go out to community parks, bring out all the equipment and all the information uh, that we had um, and engage the youth that were in the area. These were pretty popular in the sense that they were uh, all done via social media. So all the public relations were really focused on, on children and youth in a particular area of, of the city. We did a number of those uh, at low-income complexes, such as the Westgate Courtyards and uh, some of our non-traditional parks around the city uh, that are really retention basins, but we kind of did, did activities there um, because the youth felt that those were locations that we didn't have a park facility available. The other component of this was civic engagement. Um, we organized uh, different tours uh, where the youth told us they were interested in visiting. So in these particular examples, they visited the police and, and fire department. And the idea was, again, to uh, build relationships with these agencies that typically you don't see unless it's kind of an emergency situation one way or the other. The youth learn more about municipal functions. Uh, they learn to work with one another. 
and they also learn to work with the staff that uh, were working in these particular departments. So in recognition for their service and for their participation, uh, we organized a, a, a trip up to the Bay Area to visit some of the universities and, and museums. Uh, my alma mater, San Jose State's on the left. Mayor, I think you're, you're a Spartan also. So uh, we're happy to get there. And then Cal Berkeley over on, on the right in, in the pictures. Uh, it was a quick trip. Uh, I think we were gone for uh, three days, total days, but it, it was really you know, driving up and, and driving around and coming back. So uh, the youth really enjoyed it. Had a lot of positive feedback from those that, that attended. Um, as I recall, the weather didn't cooperate with us very much. Was it the weather? The weather was, was okay when we got there. It was the day before that 101 became flooded up there by Gonzales. Yeah. So, uh, but they, they persevered and, and they had a really good trip. So off to the graduating seniors. So we're, we're really happy and proud for our seniors. They had, this was a really difficult year to graduate in, as, as we all know. Everybody had to go through modified graduation ceremonies. Um, but we do want to take a second to, to recognize um, our students that graduated this year. Uh, I'd like to start just by naming the, the, going down the roster and naming the individuals. We had um, um, Alberto Dominguez, Alondra Arias, Danny Morales, and Danny will be going to uh, uh, Cal State Fullerton, Emily Espinosa, uh, Isabella Rosas, and she'll be uh, attending Hancock College, Jennifer Martinez, Jose Lisa Garcia Cruz, Kylie Anaya, she's uh, attending the Fullerton College of uh, Cosmetology and Psychology. Lisa Guzman Calderon, and she'll be attending Hancock College, and she's going to be focusing on uh, theater. Uh, uh, Natalie uh, Areola, uh, she's a Cal Poly via the Hancock Business uh, Administration Program. Uh, Wendy Reina, Yasmin Preciado Seguro, Segura, and uh, let's see, y Yamis. This is a tough one. Yami Cicelina Baez Gill. Um, these are some of our students that are participating or participated this past year. We're really happy to have had them. Uh, they were good leaders. Uh, they organized these trips and gave staff a lot of input on, on how things should go in, in our outreach to youth. The main goal was to get them involved in, uh, in the community and to learn more about the city and its operations. Um, a name that's not on here, and uh, I'll take the opportunity, is, is, is Alice Patino. Uh, the mayor took a lot of time in getting these trips organized. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Diana Reed and Tony uh, Lane and, and the city manager's office for working on a lot of details associated with these trips. And of course, the staff at the Recreation and Parks Department, David Rodriguez in particular, spent a lot of time uh, organizing and getting these things going. So Mayor, on behalf of these uh, youth, I would like to thank you and the council for supporting the, the uh, task force uh, goals. And we look forward to doing more uh, virtually, apparently, will be the way we do things from now on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Posada. Um, and I really want to thank all the council for being very supportive on this. The, the whole focus is to make sure that these young men and women um, participate in leadership and, and get to know what the city is like and to become leaders in our city. Uh, so many of them didn't know, um, you know, and I asked them, what do, what do you want to do? What do you, and uh, they said they would like to go out to the police department. That was one place that they really wanted to go. And so we were able to visit a lot of the, um, the different departments in the city because they, ha they have not been exposed to what city government is even about, you know, and so that was really important. I know that Mr. Cordero uh, put together the fishing trip, deep sea fishing trip, and, and it was really important for me to get the kids exposed to a lot of things, and so the deep sea fishing trip I thought was great, and um, 
and I said I can't go because I would get seasick. I get seasick, and I know that. And, but they were they were really good sports. And one girl that did come back. She said she got really seasick. So she said she wouldn't go again on that. But she says she's glad she went. So anyway, it was a real fun group. Um, we went to San Jose State. We went to Santa Clara, and we went to Stanford. I wish I'd given you some of the pictures that I had taken with the girls. And uh, but they they were very excited, and. They were amazed when they would see the the homeless shelters along the road, like in San, in the San Francisco area, and when we were traveling up there. So anyway, a good time. I, it's just it's so disappointing when you can't be with the kids all the time because we were meeting monthly, sometimes uh, bi-monthly. Uh, and it's really disappointing when you can't meet with them and do things with them. But anyway, I want to thank all the council for your support on this. It's very important. Thank you. Okay, the next, the next item on the agenda is the public comment period. Madam Clerk, could you please read the criteria for the public comment portion of the agenda? This time is reserved to accept comments from the public on consent agenda items, closed session items, or matters not otherwise scheduled on the printed agenda this evening. Unless otherwise directed by the mayor, speakers will have three minutes to comment. Direction to staff may be given. However, state law does not allow action to be taken on matters not on the printed agenda. And I believe Mr. McNeely is on the line with us. Thank you. And Mayor, uh, I have a suggestion for the council in the way to begin the council meeting. Um, instead of an invocation, I suggest to the council silent prayer that everyone in their own way, whether they be in the council chamber or at home on Zoom, or hopefully in the council chamber with you in the future, as a moment of silent prayer to pray in their own way. And this could be followed by a poem or a song by a young person from Santa Maria to set the tone for the meeting. I go back now to the Puritans who came from England to escape a religion that they did not believe in. A government was in control, a king, and a parliament. And they came to America. But when they came to America, they imposed their religion and their religious beliefs on the Native Americans, doing what had been done to them in their own country. The founding fathers of our country believed in a separation of church and state, and that there would be no state religion. In Santa Maria, we have Buddhists and Jews, we have Muslims and Hindus, we have Native Americans, we have people of their own personal beliefs. Now, it is true that perhaps a majority of people in Santa Maria are Christians. But is it right for Christians to impose their form of prayer on the minority? It was not correct in England. It was not correct when the Puritans imposed their religion on the Native Americans. And I believe the Christian prayer does not represent all of Santa Maria. Because of that, and because the council is on record as saying that they want to represent all the people of Santa Maria, I believe silent prayer is the most appropriate kind of prayer because it offends no one, it represents everyone. It's equal under the law. And I believe that from now on, we should begin our council meetings with silent prayer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers? We may have one more speaker. Um, Mr. Solomon, would you like to speak now, or did you want to wait until um, item 4A? Uh, I should speak now if you'd like. Sure, you're welcome to. Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Cliff Solomon, and I am alarmed about the continuing increase of the confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Santa Maria especially among our agricultural workers. As of yesterday, the Santa Barbara County Public Health Department is reporting 3,892 
confirmed cases of COVID-19, 45% of whom are Latino Hispanic. Having attended the last council meeting virtually, I'm aware that both the city and county are working to enforce COVID-19 health codes, but efforts don't seem to be working. Why did it take the death of Leo Chavez to start a serious investigation into the working and living conditions for H-2A workers? While investigating, investigation is a step in the right direction. Mark Vandekamp was quoted in today's Santa Maria Times as stating that while some H-2A residential homes have been inspected, partially converted motel sites have not been inspected because the city doesn't even know where these are unless the growers reveal this information. Surely in the midst of a pandemic, this information could be made available to the city by the growers. I've heard that the city has established a task force, primarily staffed by city employees, to investigate the pandemic issues. Again, it's a good step, but I would encourage the city to broaden the participants in this effort to include nonprofits who are already engaged in serving the needs of residents, who understand how to distribute up-to-date information in languages that are linguistically and culturally appropriate. And in order for the task force to be more transparent and accountable to the residents of Santa Maria, I suggest this council member Soto be added. First of all, her district is, has the highest number of cases in the city. Second, she is bilingual. And thirdly, she is very visible and accessible to her constituents and trusted by them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Any That's others? all we have for That's speakers. It. Okay, if you'll notice, we each have this that says mic is on. And when you're not speaking, then just turn your mic off. Thank you. Before we move on, Mr. Stowell, did you have any comments you wanted to make? Okay, moving on to the consent calendar. Madam Clerk, could you please read item number three? The following routine items are presented for city council approval without discussion as a single agenda item in order to expedite the meeting. The consent calendar is approved by roll call vote with one motion. These items are discussed only on request of council members. Does anyone have items they wish to pull for discussion? No, Madam Mayor, uh, and if there isn't, I'd like to uh, make a, re a recommendation to adopt the consent calendar as submitted. Okay. Second. Um, having heard a motion and a second, any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Motes? Aye. Council Member Soto? Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. So next we have a presentation. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will receive an update regarding the coronavirus situation. And City Manager, Director of Emergency Services, Mr. Sewell. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the Council. Our update tonight will uh, focus on three areas. One, uh, updating of the statistics of where we are with the pandemic as it impacts the city of Santa Maria. Um, second, uh, update on our community outreach team, the task force, and then third, how we're supporting our businesses with outreach and uh, uh, information exchange. And um, Todd Tuggle, Chief Tuggle will be here with the data shortly, but I can start off by explaining the uh, community outreach team as um, that has stood up. We've had three meetings of the coordination effort. It's including our fire, risk management, emergency management, code enforcement, media outreach, mapping, and chamber partners. Um, we, the primary effort here is uh, at this point trying to get a better flow of information exchange. We heard at the last city council meeting that the county asked for help by the city to uh, provide outreach information and in supporting uh, enforcement of the public health orders. Um, and so we are here to help, but we have uh, indicated to the county that we need better health analysis and health information in order to be effective in doing so. In specific, we've asked to uh, make sure that we get consistent information to our dispatchers so when they're dispatching our employees, we understand what the COVID risk is to the address being dispatched, uh, that we understand the community breakdown of, of the uh, COVID cases so we can identify um, where we can be most effective in our outreach and our efforts. Uh, we've heard a lot about the demographics and focusing on certain segments of the demographics. We want to have consistent information on 
uh, who in our community is getting COVID and how we can address those uh, particular populations. Um, we are seeking more information on uh, um, complaint analysis. So as uh, the county mentioned at the last meeting, the complaints can be submitted to the county. For the most part, they just send them to code enforcement for us to enforce. Um, and a couple things that would help for us that we've mentioned to the county um, and that this ta it would make this task force more effective would be um, uh, for us to understand what the public health risks are of these complaints. There's a variety of complaints. If they can provide some initial triage analysis of it, of these are top complaints we really need to address and these are other complaints that we should be addressing that allow us to prioritize our staffing as well. And also we want to make sure we're consistent following the county health order here uh, with the rest of the county. We hear that the county sheriff does a certain level of enforcement. Cities on the south coast do a d different level of enforcement. It is the same public health order. We want to um, at least understand what a consistent outreach approach would be. So uh, we're not asking public health to come out and you know, be the boots on the ground necessarily. We're happy to help and augment that. We have asked for them to be members of the team. They have offered staffing to the team as well. Um, it's the boots on the ground folks who are with environmental health who know our community. We want to further expand that out to public health experts, um, Marion Hospital, and to mapping folks from the county as well. Um, just to uh, be able to understand we're happy to do the work, but we're not the experts on health and the health analysis. So that value add would be really important for us to be effective as we're reaching out to our businesses and community. The other big part of the task force is educational outreach. Um, we um, are encouraging people in our community to take precautions and also um, letting them know what to do if they are infected or have symptoms. We have uh, reached out to Emerald Wave Media, American General Media, which comprise many of the local English and Spanish radio stations in the city for them, and they are willing to be able to help us with the outreach. Uh, we'll use the city's social media platforms, and um, we've also reached out to the State Department of Social Services regarding the congregate care facilities. As the county mentioned at the last meeting, those are separately regulated, and so we again want to understand their quarantine requirements and ensure compliance with the fire code. We, uh, you know, when, when there is an issue in those facilities, they dial 911 like anyone else and our emergency responders go there. So we want to make sure we're again coordinated and safe with our approaches there. And then finally, and I can segue to uh, Mr. Morris is uh, we are assisting our businesses with building code, fire code, um, and code enforcement, uh, municipal code enforcement staff to help our, the businesses, whether help the businesses mitigate, whether it's moving outdoors, putting up tents, and compliance with the rules. And one thing we're well, there are two things we're seeing. Um, one is uh, businesses don't understand the rules, like we've all seen. They change really weekly basis, and there may be a plan for a certain change coming down the line, and it, and that may end up being something different before it gets down the line. And the other side of it is uh, businesses realize, they don't necessarily realize there's this structure in place of guidelines and a reopening plan and mitigation efforts and, and self-certifications. And um, for us to be able to go out to the businesses and apprise them of that, uh, what we're seeing is, um, you know, one business understands that goes through the process, the other business says, hey, they're open, I'll be open too and for us to be able to reach out and inform them of what the reopening means, how to do it safely, how to make sure their employees are safe, their customers are safe, and what to do if they um, do have uh, symptomatic patients or customers and ways to mitigate that. And so I think we can turn it over to Glenn who can give an update on the business impacts, how we're working to support them. We understand they're in a difficult environment. We've seen businesses closed and allowed to reopen and closed again and um, you know it's we're hearing that it's difficult on the employees difficult on trying to run a business difficult to invest in in the community and, and in their work and so we want to be sure to help them be able to manage this moving environment and do so in a safe way which allows their employees and our residents and their customers to um, be able to avoid contaminating themselves with the virus so thank you thanks. Mr. Morris. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Thank you, Mr. Stillwell. Um, you, you know, one of the 
for the last, oh, I don't know, 90, 100, some odd days, time blurs, right? Uh, we have really been trying to, uh, our, our primary focus has really been on educating the businesses and making sure that they understood um, both the, the environment in which they can operate um, as well as the resources that are available to help them in operating successfully. And, and we're, we're continuing to do that kind of work and really trying to encourage um, best practices. So as we get um, information about businesses that are going through the attestation process with the county, we have an outreach um, that we do you know, to those businesses. As we get um, calls, um, like I'm sure your code enforcement folks do over the uh, weekend, um, usually our voicemails uh, load up over the weekend with people uh, who have um, uh, suggestions about how things could be done better in the community and we try to follow up with those businesses and, and help them understand you know, what, what they can and can't do. Um, you know, there's been some discussion about um, the need to coordinate better with the county. Um, I, I will give them some kudos um, you know, as they decided to really uh, ramp up their messaging around the wearing of face masks. Um, um, it, we were encouraged that they reached out and asked to participate in our uh, Respect Protect campaign that the city, um, Marion, and the Chamber and the Community College launched um, about two months ago. And rather than creating yet another campaign with, with different messaging, the county um, just jumped in and, and has encouraged the South County um, cities to, to do the same. And so. I thought that was a good step um, in the right direction in terms of coordinating. As we look to, to the inevitable um, need to rebuild our businesses and our local economy, um, we really put, the, we put a plan together that includes four different aspects, uh, and I wanted to give you a quick update on three of those this evening. Uh, the first is the need to get good data to really understand what's happening on the ground in the community and use that to guide everything else we're doing. So. Uh, we completed our first um, what will be monthly survey uh, of businesses, and I'll share some of those results with you in just a moment. Uh, the second is uh, we are preparing a public awareness campaign um, that really has a couple of different objectives, and we'll talk about that. I'll, I'll uh, show you some previews of some of the uh, uh, collateral that's coming out on that. Uh, the third is the um, establishment of a volunteer advisor committee. Uh, I'm calling them our, our business triage team. Um, these are um, individuals who are semi-retired or recently retired, successful business owners or operators who uh, have agreed on a volunteer basis as we get businesses that call us and say, I, I need help, I don't know where to go, um, that these folks will go in and do an initial assessment, help them identify what's their primary first need, and then we'll work with them to connect them to a resource that can that can support them in that need. And then the fourth piece, and this will come a little later, uh, is, is education around really just how to more effectively operate a business in the community. Um, and, and that will, will be the kind of the last piece that we bring forward. And so quick uh, highlights from our survey that we uh, just got back from our folks. And we asked them, what are the, what are the impacts? How has COVID-19 impacted your business? Um, I don't think any of these are, are um, terribly surprising. Um, but the number one impact has been the increased costs of, of mitigating, um, which I take as an, a little bit of an encouraging sign because what that tells me is businesses are spending the money to do it right. They're, they're buying the plexiglass, they're um, you know, ordering the sanitizer, they're getting the masks and those kinds of things. Um, they're now moving outdoors and renting tents and awnings um, to be able to continue to do their business carefully and, and safely. Um, you know, we, we kind of hit the top five out of, I, I think there were probably 15 or so um, choices that we gave folks. These were the ones that were most popular. Um, I was encouraged also to see that in that top five was not um, sending all my people home or, or um, furloughing or laying them off. Um, it was on the list, uh, but it wasn't in the top five. If you're curious, it was number seven. <laughs> um, so, you know, it is happening, but again, I think this is a, a sign that our businesses are trying to um, stay the course and, and be ready when, when uh, the, uh, um, the, the pandemic is under more control and we can reopen more fully. Uh, so we asked them about revenue, um, and this is where it gets a little um, concerning, and I think this one's evident of, of the impacts of the open close um, mentality, you know, approach that we've been taking uh, with our economy. 
53% uh, of our respondents said that their revenue had gone down at least 25% in the last 30 days. So this is not since this thing started, but in that last 30 days. And again, if you'll think about that 30 days, that's when we started to reopen and then wound it back down. 23% um, said that they had lost at least 75% of their revenue in that 30-day window. So that's the, that's the concerning piece long term is how long can they continue uh, to sustain in that kind of an environment. We asked them, what do you, what do you need? What do you need? Uh, and, and, you know, cash flow and, and uh, revenue is, is number one. Um, so we're continuing to try to help businesses um, connect to the federal programs. There, there is still money in the PPP program. Um, you know, they can continue to work uh, with their local bankers um, to secure those loans. Um, the rules continue to change. Uh, the IRS continues to put out new guidance, but, but there are funds available. Uh, we are also working with city staff and the Santa Barbara Foundation on a potential grant program that we hope to roll out um, next month that will provide small, modest um, assistance to um, really very small businesses in our community. And um, again, we hope to have those details ready to share with you um, early in August. What foundation is that again? I'm sorry? What foundation? Uh, so the Santa Barbara Foundation is the lead um, on, in, in organizing uh, the program. You may have read some media coverage. They just agreed on a program in, with the city of Goleta. Um, that was their first one. Um, they then came and reached out to us about North County and we are working with them, um, partnering with your staff, but also the staff in Guadalupe and in the Fourth District's office, supervisor's office um, around the city, uh, around the community of Orchid. Um, you know, Santa Marans are by nature a bit of an optimistic folk, uh, but, but there is some caution there. So 54%, just over half of our folks said that for them, their business today is okay, and they expect it will get better over the next six months. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, that means that they have some hope that they'll that this is going to turn a corner quickly and they'll be able to sustain and move forward. Uh, when they broaden that lens a little bit and we ask them about the regional economy, uh, there's a little less surety, right? So almost three quarters said that they really don't have a good handle on what they think our regional economy is going to look like as we move forward. So those are some highlights. Again, we're gonna do this survey monthly and we'll continue to update that. And as those of you that work with survey data understand that, that over time, the numbers themselves are not the important pieces, the trends, right? And, and what we hope to see is that those trends move in the direction of optimism and success um, and away from concern and risk, right? We mentioned that we were gonna be kind of rolling out a campaign um, to, we're calling it internally the Support Santa Maria Valley campaign. There are four objectives for this campaign. Uh, one is to build confidence in our local consumers that they can trust the businesses that have reopened properly uh, and gone through the attestation process, um, that, that they can feel confident in doing business with them. The second objective is to remind them about why local businesses are important to them, to their community, to their families. The third is to increase economic activity. We need to get folks out there um, shopping and spending uh, money locally. And, we probably all need to unwind some bad habits we've gotten into of clicking to buy, right? So it's time to go back to our local stores first uh, and, and use the internet when there's no other alternatives. So that's the third. And then the fourth is to encourage uh, positive individual action, right? So there will be a component of this. Um, and if you look at the bottom of the signs, there's some subtle messaging in there about wear your mask, separate from each other, wash your hands, right? So. That's the way what we as individuals can do uh, to support these businesses in addition to buying from them. So these are some samples of some uh, ads that will be coming out. Uh, the campaign will include radio, television, uh, and, and a lot of digital um, um, platforms. Uh, we're, we tend to run this campaign through the end of the calendar year, so this is a, an investment that we're making that, that will last for some time. Um, there's a couple of other kind of how they will play out in uh, more of a, a digital form, um, and um, as you can see, these will be in both English and Spanish as they continue to build out. Uh, our hope, we're trying to get these all finished up here in the next week or so, uh, and the intent is to launch the campaign uh, the first week of August. So with that, um, the, the third piece of the final that I wanted to touch on today, again, is this triage team. 
there is a form available on our website. You can see the address there. Um, as you interact with local businesses, if they just are at a point where they don't know what to do next, if they've kind of you know run through their own options list and they need help, uh, we have help available. And, and the best way to get that started is to go to the website, fill out this quick little form. It is confidential. Uh, we will send out um, one or two of our uh, volunteer um, advisors who will uh, meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, help them identify what is the first step they can take to rebuild their business. Uh, and then we will, support, we will work with that advisor and the local business to connect them to the right resource, whether that's a public agency, whether that's an organization like um, the Small Business Development Center, um, whether it's a financial resource, wherever they need to go, um, that's what we're going to try to get them. Um, we don't profess to be the, uh, the answer. We don't, we don't own those answers, um, but we own the Rolodex that can help find them. So we would encourage um, all businesses out there that need support and assistance to, to, to reach out through the chamber. Um, and we would encourage you as you are as public figures and have those conversations with local businesses and they're asking, where do I turn? Who can help me? Uh, point them to us and we'll make sure they get connected. Uh, with that, Mayor, I'd be happy to answer any questions or turn it back over to the city manager. Any questions of Mr. Morris? Oh, Ms. Seto? Yes, um, my question um, is um, to both um, Mr. Morris and our city manager and city attorney, um, I've been receiving emails again of um, either um, businesses not continuing on with their um, safety protocols. Like um, this week I received an email from um, a resident who was concerned about um, the Vons um, grocery store. Um, saying how they've got they've removed some of like the social distancing signage and so my question is um as some of the businesses are being more lenient and we're seeing the rise of covid cases what are we able to do to ensure the safety of um residents but the employees as the employees as well I guess I'll respond to that. Um, with respect to elements such as that, you know, my office regularly has um, both referrals from public health as well as items we receive from the website, telephone calls. We average between one and 200 um, regular uh, reports on a weekly basis. So we first start with uh, a initial investigation to do a drive-by, see whether or not um, what the reporting party has said is, is accurate, and then we try and educate to provide um, the best practices. By way of example, with respect to the bonds, uh, I got that report uh, Monday or Sunday night. I drove there Monday morning and identified that on a, on a corporate basis, they made a determination to have consistent activity at all of their locations and the one here actually had more than other stores so they as a corporate made a determination to have them consistent i did see signage on masking i did see mask on patrons i did see social media signs so we do that so we triage it with respect to is it accurate if it's accurate then um, is there additional education needed so we make contact with managers we make contact with principals in charge and identify, first of all, are they aware of it? If they're aware of it, how can we help? And we will, again, refer them to chamber, we refer them to other resources. And then the last part of your question is, how do we protect employees? We technically don't. Because again, what we are trying to do as a code is protect the public at large. And we are endeavoring to provide management who is has a has a vested interest in the health and safety of their employees with the tools that we have available if we see something egregious that would require additional enforcement tools we have other resources by way of example with respect to alcohol-based uh, organizations bars restaurants we have public health we have abc we utilize licensure um, 
agencies because they have more of a stick than, than a simple code element. Um, but we do what we can to try and provide the health and safety to all of our community members. Again, using five officers on 200 plus cases a week, um, we're quite busy. But I do know we've sent a lot of uh, uh, folks to uh, the chamber. The other thing, and, and I have to put this out to the public, the, the difficulty we have is the rules are changing quite rapidly. Many people in our business community, especially in our Hispanic business community, have not heard the word attestation, nor do they understand what it is. What they've heard is their type of business can be open. And so therefore they come forward and they open. That doesn't necessarily mean they have an effective safety plan or even uh, a safety plan that meets with the guidelines, and we try and assist them with that, both, both English, Spanish, and, and other languages to the extent we can, so that they can have the tools, because again, they have a vested interest in their staying open and in protecting their, their employees. So that's, that's how we do it. Councilor Soto, if I could just add two quick points to that. Um, one, I, we've just completed um, a grant application with the uh, code enforcement team. Uh, they, they're the lead on it. We supported that application. Um, specifically designed for outreach um, and education, so it would help us to, um, you know, ramp up the materials that we can pass around to folks. All you know, the, the educational tools. So, so that's in the works as well. Um, the other point that I think I would make. Um, not, not specifically for you, but for the listening audience. The best thing that people can do who are concerned about the health of employees is take personal responsibility and wear a mask when they enter the business. Mm -hmm. Often what we're finding is that the businesses that are pulling back are doing so because they feel like that's what they need to do to protect their employees from abuse and from you know folks that are frankly just rude um, and, and, are, and are attacking these you know, employees. Um, and so, you know, the, the key message I would give to folks is if you're concerned about those people, put your mask on and be polite. Mm -hmm. um, a follow-up question, Sorry. if I may, Madam Go ahead. Um, is have we been able to um, figure out how we're going to enforce the, health, the public health officer's um, policies? Have we heard from public health as to what means what what we can do to help enforce those policies other than just educate well again we we have tools one of the tool the best tool we have is when an attestation is filled out that then is consent to a public health order and therefore we can then utilize that uh, if they're violating that because we can ask do you have your attestation do you have your safety plan are you following it and, and we can use enforcement tools under the public health order. My division cannot because it's enforceable through uh, law enforcement. But again, we have thus far not found um, any specific business to be unwilling to be corrected. Um, we've had a lot that are unable to based on finances, based on physical structures, and they've modified or changed their behavior. We had an example of a restaurant that put up a tent so that they could have outside dining. And then it closed it with four walls, which made it a building. <laughs> so when they were educated that no, the purpose is to have airflow through, then they immediately fixed that and were within compliance. And that's typically, it, it really is a trying to follow very changing, rapidly changing, and, and sometimes contradictory rules that we're finding that we can assist them with. If, if we found a, an organization that was intentionally acting in a way that either was going to harm the public or harm their employees, we would gather all the tools and not just rely on code enforcement, but we would gather a public health officer, ourselves, a law enforcement officer, and solve that problem. We thus far have not had to bring in the big guns, but we, we have that capability. Any other questions? I know that when I receive any of these complaints, I immediately forward them um, to our city manager and our city attorney, and, and I, I got that one. It's, it's interesting how some of these stores 
implement um, the guidelines and I I go around to different ones because I want to see what's going on and I know at the Vons they were blocking off one door and you could only go in one door and you have, could only go out go out another door and so it was almost like uh, with the guidelines it was overkill of the guidelines I don't know that you could overkill this actually but 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 you know I mean the, you know what the guidelines were and then you'd go to another grocery store and it seemed much more lax but they were have the, putting the social distancing some stores will remind people you'll hear it over the speakers and some stores don't um, so it's um, the, 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 like you said, Mr. Morris, each one of us have to, has that responsibility to pay attention to what we're doing, and it's really, you know, it's difficult. And I know the checkers in these stores don't like to say anything because they don't want to see the wrath of God coming down on them. I, I, ha I had someone tell me about um, uh, two young girls that work, I think it was at Trader Joe's, and the line out there is every six feet. And someone came by in, in a car and was very abusive with these girls because they worked there and he was never going to shop there again uh, because of this. And I, you know, some of the ugliness is coming out in people with all this going on, but we'll, we'll, make, we'll make it through. Yes, Ms. Soto? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have one other question. Um, we all heard about um, the, the COVID-19 outbreak at an H-2A um, contractor. Um, and my question is, um, I know that at the last city council meeting, one of the things that um, I suggested w um, were to, um, for community, the community development department to see if we would be able to work something through the over-the-counter permits um, to ensure that they are, um, again, protecting um, the safe, not protecting the safety and welfare of their employees, but making sure that they are concurrent with the public health guidelines. And so I'm wondering if there's been any move on that. Um, Tom started answering that, but uh, so it's um, the interface we have between public health uh, regulation of employees and regulation of the health order. Um, and so from our, from our uh, point of view with regulating the housing, um, we haven't had a housing um, permit issued for H2A at this point that um, has required any modifications or clarifications to that, to the COVID mitigations. Um, and I don't know if Tom can talk more about uh, that particular case or similar ones to that. Well, I can tell you that, that we have, again, my team, I'm just going to tell you, are amazing. They worked really hard, and, and they heard that, and they reached out, and they immediately contacted the Ag Commissioner, and they've been working, again, outside of their normal scope to try and get um, additional resources. So they even, you know, are starting to contact the, the folks who were at the H-2A, um, you know, who are supporting and promoting the H-2A program here in Santa Maria and saying, you know, we need to reach out to you so you can reach to your growers and make sure that they're getting educated. So we're, we're doing that. Um, you know, it's, I, I, every tragedy is, is difficult right now, um, but, but we're looking at, the, at, at 107,000 people and doing what we can to protect all of them. And so that is another way, is we're reaching out, again, proactively, to other departments, to other resources that aren't in the COVID, COVID fight and trying to get them engaged to help us get that education to the fields, get that education to their employees and to the housing office. So we're working on that. But at this point, it, it doesn't sound like we are working on um, revising the over-the-counter permit for H-2A to ensure that um, they are, that the housing where they're being housed, where the workers are being housed, um, is is concurrent with the public health guidelines. If if the again the 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 structure that the council determined in the ordinance did not incorporate commercial elements, so this goes back to an education as opposed to an enforcement element. And most of the public health officer determinations do not incorporate housing as a specific health officer order. 
So we don't have any teeth to do that. What we can, what we can do is, is to educate because the public health officer has not mandated certain elements in housing. They've not said you cannot have, you know, uh, four people in a, in a house, four people in an H-2A facility, or, or 16 people in a single family residence. We don't have that tool. The public health order has not addressed it, but we are trying to edu address it through education proactively. So there wouldn't be a reason for us to revise the license because it's neither licensed under the health order nor is it licensed under our H-2A program. And Madam yes, Mayor, going, Mr. Stowell. I'm going back to your earlier point about the business and the different mitigations we're seeing from the businesses and, and following up on Mr. Morris's point about the employees. We heard on our uh, legislative call last week and we've heard from our police department that many of the calls that we get from law enforcement are not so much to um, help enforce a health order but help to um, enforce the safety of the business or of the employees. We, have, um, we heard the sheriff last uh, Thursday talk about uh, calls they've, re he's, they've received, the sheriff's department from employers, uh, businesses, saying we have a person in here who is violating the health order or um, you know, is disregarding our uh, mitigation efforts. And we've heard that the law enforcement in those cases come to enforce the trespassing and property rights of the business to have the right to be able to refuse service to anyone. And um, the, the, even on those cases, we haven't seen where it's required severe enforcement action or arresting anyone or issuing citations. It's just another education effort. But I think you said the education takes a different form when the police show up and tell the guy to knock it off. So, um, so it, yeah, it is a balance on all sides here with both enforcing a health order and enforcing uh, the business's ability to keep their employees safe and try to run the business. And private property. And property rights. And, um, and as we continue the discussion, we can continue the presentation with Chief Tuggle, who has an update on um, where we are in Santa Maria with, our, um, with the COVID statistics and where we are both in a community and with the city. Thank you. Us. Yeah. Um, 
And then as of today, that number is down to 795. So in the last 14 days, we've had 795 cases. So what that does show is that uh, hopefully we are working our way towards the downward trend. But as I said, maybe caution, we had one of these uh, a few weeks ago and uh, we saw that spike jump right back up. Uh, we still are seeing cases in the um, uh, skilled nursing facilities, the care facilities, not just skilled nursing, but the care facilities in general. Um, and I'll speak to an issue with that, and it kind of ties in with what um, Ms. Watts was saying earlier with regards to uh, businesses, the, uh, the care facilities are doing their best to comply with the health order. And in some cases, they're required, well, in all those cases, they're required to quarantine uh, patients coming in to the facility. So what they've done is try to set up makeshift facilities, in some cases putting plastic sheeting on walls and things like that. So we are constantly finding new cases where, again, like Ms. Watson said, they're violating a building code or a fire code, and so we're coming in and offering that educational piece to say that, it, it, that we understand what you're doing, can we offer some advice and maybe try this instead of that. Um, everybody's been very... Um, very compliant with that so far. And the most recent case was at 1405 East Main Street. Um, they were using the fourth floor as a, uh, um, as a quarantine area, and so we're offering that help to them. So, um, hospitalizations is another, um, another metric that's being looked at thus far. Uh, the county as a whole has been looking fairly good. Um, and then, um, the metrics that we're not doing so well on as a county, um, but I think it's fairly obvious to say that Santa Maria contributes to this, is the, um, the positive testing rate um, in the past seven days. So the, the metric that's used by the state is an 8% test positive testing rate over the last seven days. Um, the county as a whole has been well over 10 for uh, going all the way back to, well, back to the 15th, which is that dip that I spoke of earlier. Um, right now, we were at 12.1% a few days ago, down to 10.4%. So again, that trajectory is looking positive in the sense that it's going down. However, um, it's not where we need it to be just yet. Um, testing rates seem to be fairly good. Um, the metric is 1.5 per thousand. Uh, the county as a whole is well over two uh, and has been over three at certain points. So um, testing sometimes can be difficult to get a hold of or difficult to schedule. However, um, based on the metrics, uh, the county is succeeding at that. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, I did want to mention um, is that uh, we did reach out to the county um, public health to in the task force that um, still what we mentioned earlier. Um, thus far, the response on the data and the analysis, um, we have not received anything um, with regards to any deeper analysis than what we can all get on the, the Santa Barbara County Public Health webpage. So um, we have reached out to them, um, and uh, that was uh, two weeks ago. And thus far, we have received um, nothing in terms of uh, tangible data or analysis to help guide our efforts for the task force. Um, we did uh, reinstitute some data sharing on the emergency response side, uh, which we were getting early on, which helps protect our emergency responders uh, by alerting them that um, there may be or there is there has been a positive case in the past. So our folks have that awareness going into a scene. Um, to not only um, treat the patient accordingly, but also to um, out of concern and dealing with the family and, and the potential spread there. So um, that uh, that pretty well concludes the uh, the presentation on the statistics that I have and how it relates to Santa Maria. Ms. Warren, yeah. um, what about the recovery rates? How fast are we recovering from the COVID? Uh, in terms of individual recoveries, or well, just as you've given us uh, rates of you know the. County of Santa Barbara is 51.24, Santa Maria is 22.65. Out of oh. those, you know, what are those numbers coming down to be? So one of the numbers, I, I think if I understand you right, ma'am, one, one of the numbers you're looking for is the active cases. So that would kind of by implication, the rest of those would be um, recovery cases. Yeah. Um, so uh, 
total cases, active cases right now is 295 in the city. Um, and 400, oh, excuse me, that's for the county, I'm sorry. Yeah, we didn't have that many uh, cases uh, in total in the last few weeks. Uh, I'm sorry, that was 295 in the county, active cases. Um, and at the peak, uh, or at one of the peaks recently, it was 414 active cases. So yes, there are a significant cover, amount recovering. So and to your point, yeah. 4,797 have recovered. Yeah, that's, that's the number we're missing <laughs> when people are, right, are, are right. You know, listening. Yeah, that is it, correct. Just because yes. that, that is good news right there. That so, is correct, yes. Absolutely. No. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mopes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> How about the death rate? How many people are actually dying? And the second question is, where are all these tests being performed? I know we have the free testing out by the fairgrounds, but does that also include all the tests that are done with every admission to the hospital and in private doctor's offices? I honestly, I don't have the, uh, the answer to that question. Um, the first part of the question, sir, was the basically the mortality rate. Um, I don't have that specific number. The number of fatalities is, um, double check, 32. Uh, so they're listing the death rate at 1% or mortality rate at 1%. Um, regarding testing, um, obviously the metrics show that the testing rates are, are adequate uh, in terms of per thousand uh, people or uh, per thousand population. Um, so, but I, I, anecdotally, um, tests are very hard to come by. Uh, we had to have several members uh, tested and those tests were uh, fairly difficult to get a hold of. Um, the Fair Park has been very accommodating. Uh, they have been producing a fair amount of tests, but uh, I think that would be, um, I'm gonna defer that one to the, to the experts with the county that have the, the specific numbers on who is testing and how many they are actually conducting. Madam Mayor, I could follow up on a couple points there. Yes. So the, um, uh, Dr. Motes a couple meetings ago talked about the advantage of pool testing and is, that is something now that the federal government or CDC is allowed. Um, so that will, I think, help as you start going through the system to be able to um, test the results of multiple individuals at once. And if, if one of those batches is positive, then you go back and test the individual. So that will increase the capacity of testing. I think you mentioned 10 pool, but I think they're, they've permitted four. So, but it will, that will expand capacity. And then uh, Santa Maria specific death rate, supporting what Chief Tuggle said about the trend, we had no additional deaths this last week. So um, each, I think for the city itself, we're at 18 or somewhere. Um, so we've been, um, I think that might correspond also with what Chief Tuggle was saying, we're, we're could be cautiously hopeful that we're on a positive trend. Um, and then the, the test, yeah, the testing overall, we heard from, I think, Sue Anderson a couple uh, meetings ago that uh, the testing data that's provided to public health is the public health testing data and the state data, I think, was separate. So, but, um, so it, it probably doesn't encompass all the testing that goes on here with the testing that public health is administering or overseeing. Mr. Silva, do you have the mortality rate for data for the state? No. Do you know that? I'm, I, I do not. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Stowell? So that concludes our presentation or update for this uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the next we have an appointments. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title and, st and um, start the staff yeah, report? Staff report. Sure. The City Council will consider making appointments to the Block Grants Advisory Committee, the Library Board of Trustees, and the Santa Barbara County Library Advisory Board. We'll start with the Block Grants Advisory Committee, which has five terms to fill ending in July 2023. Uh, applications were received from incumbents Esther Acosta and Georgina Duran-Khan, and two new applications were received from Corey Armstrong and Isaac Baruman. Sarah Mustafa, uh, previously appointed by Mayor Patino, has moved out of the area and did not reapply. Following the nominations, the appointments are to be made by Mayor Patino with ratification by the City Council. Okay, so um, Councilmember Cordero isn't here. 
Um, Council Member Motes, do you have a nomination? Okay, and I will go ahead and second that. Should we do it now or put them all together? Okay. And Madam Mayor, I would like to go ahead and appoint um, Georgina Duran Khan. In the last three years, she's only missed one meeting. She's an amazing, she's very dedicated, amazing lady. So I definitely want to keep her. <laughs> she is a um, very, very bright woman. Yes, yeah, she is. Oh my gosh. Very dedicated. Absolutely. Council Member Soto. Madam Mayor, I'd, I'd like to um, make my appointment at a later time. Okay. Thank you. And I will also make mine at a later date. So we have um, Council Member Motes nomination of Esther Acosta and Council Member Waterfield's nomination of Georgina Duran gone. And I will second that. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Council Member Motes? Aye. Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Uh, Madam Mayor Bettino? Aye. And Council Member Soto? Aye. Okay, the next one we have is the um, opportunity to appoint one member to the Library Board of Trustees for a three-year term ending in July 2023. One application was received from incumbent Laura Salkin, and Mayor Patino would make the appointment with ratification by the City Council. So I would like to make a motion to appoint Laura Selkin to the Library Board of Trustees. I will second that. Thank you, and I have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Mayor Patino? Aye. Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Motes? Aye. And Council Member Soto? Aye. And our final one is the Santa Barbara County Library Advisory Board, which runs concurrently with the countywide library agreement each year from July through the following June. The mayor will have the opportunity to appoint one member for a term ending in July 2021. One application was received from incumbent Betty Gunn, and uh, Mayor Patino would make the appointment with ratification by the City Council. Thank you. I'll make a motion to appoint Betty Gunn to the Santa, Santa Barbara County Library Advisory Committee. Second. Okay, I have a second. Any comments from the council? Any discussions? Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mayor Patino? Aye. Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Soto? Aye. And Council Member Motes? Aye. And I want to thank everyone very much who volunteers for their, the boards and committees. That takes, takes a lot of work and effort, and it's so appreciated. Um, next, we have a public hearing. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will conduct a public hearing to consider protests to the proposed assessments for the City's annual weed abatement program to be collected as part of the 2020-21 property tax rules. And the staff report has been made by our City Attorney, Mr. Watson. Madam Mayor, members of the Council, uh, as the Council is aware, uh, pursuant to Resolution 2020-19, um, this Code Division provided owners of 167 properties um, with an abatement letter. I am very pleased to advise you that of that, 166 cleaned up their property. Wow. So um, this, the code division is, uh, is doing good at least with cleaning up weeds and we have one remaining, uh, which is APN 11170404, uh, 15,000 square feet was abated for a total cost of $276.94. And I would uh, recommend that the council adopt the resolution. Thank you very much. Good work. Good work, code compliance people. Um, so if no discussion, Madam Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution. Okay, I, need to, I need to see if there's any request. Yeah, any request to speak? No, Madam Mayor, we do not. No written requests? Okay. So I'll bring it back to the council. You can make the motion. Make a motion to adopt resolution confirming the weed abatement costs for assessment purposes by the City Attorney Code Enforcement Division regarding APN 1170 Second. Okay. I have a motion and a second. And any further discussion on the resolution? If not, the we um, confirm the weed abatement costs for the assessment purposes. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Motes? Aye. Council Member Soto? Aye. And Madam Mayor Patel? Aye. 
Next, we have another public hearing. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider a recommendation of the Planning Commission to approve a Supplemental Environmental Impact Report, a Specific Plan Amendment, and a General Plan Land Use Amendment and Zone Change for the Jones-Romer family to rezone a 37.6-acre site located at Highway 101 and East Seward Avenue. Staff report is to be made by Senior Planner, Mr. Albro. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the Council. Uh, the project site is the last remaining undeveloped portion of the 1994 Rivergate Romer specific plan located at the northern boundary of the city adjacent to U.S. Highway 101 and the Santa Maria River. The specific, specific plan covers approximately 194 acres and uh, except for this particular project site, the specific plan has been built out. The project site is approximately 37 acres, and I, as I mentioned before, is bounded uh, by Broadway Highway 135 interchange to the northwest, U.S. Highway 101 to the west, the Santa Maria River levee to the northeast, and the River Oaks residential subdivision to the east. Um, south of the project is Borges Road and Jim May Park. So here's an enlarged version or uh, view of the specific project site. This is the project parcel. And the proposal, um, let me just step back. Here's a view um, looking towards the east. And you can see the Santa Maria River uh, levee and also the escarpment on the far side of the river. Uh, here's a view on the top left is looking um, south and then the uh, right hand side picture is looking generally southwest and you can see the development on the other side on the uh, west side of Highway 101. And finally here's a view from the current termination of Seaward Avenue. Uh, it's very difficult to see in this picture, but if um, you look closely above the end sign there in the lower port of the portion of the picture, uh, the um, Broadway northbound interchange ramp is visible um, in the distance. And you can see the levee on the right-hand side of the photograph. So the proposal um, is to modify the current land use and zoning designation, which involves a general plan amendment, a zoning change, and a specific plan amendment. Uh, currently, the site is primarily uh, community commercial with a C2 zoning. Um, on the north-hand side, closest to the interchange, there exists freeway service designation, and that's approximately two acres. And then uh, the orange on the east and south boundaries of the C2 is zoned HDR, excuse me, designated HDR with a PDR3 high density residential zoning. The proposal is to remove the freeway service designation, and that's two acres, and the 5.5 acres of the high density residential. I'll go back to the existing. You can see the north and the south boundaries of the project this is what the applicant is requesting to make the entire project PDC2. Um, so that would result in approximately 29 and a half acres of PDC2. Um, just for the, the council's information, the Planning Commission recommended approval of this change at their meeting in June. The applicant had a number of different uh, goals for the project. Obviously, removing the R3 designation, they cited the difficulty of the odd shape and limited acreage of that R3 designation in terms of actually getting a, a high-density residential project on a parcel that shape and size. They'd also like to maximize the commercial area, and this is not only in terms of the regional nature of the commercial in that location, but also to serve the what is currently underserved northeast area of the city uh, by providing them with some commercial opportunities. Uh, emphasizing the northern gateway to the city with um, high quality commercial. And then finally, um, the increased flexibility 
of the C2 zone compared to the freeway service zone. The freeway service zone has very limited uses that are allowed or even conditionally allowed, whereas the C2 zone is our most flexible and accommodating uh, commercial zone. Uh, and again, the Planning Commission recommended uh, that the Council approve these changes at their June 17th meeting. So because the original specific plan was approved in 1994, uh, and the changes to the community and the changes to state law since that time, uh, we had to relook at environmental or potential environmental impacts of this project change. Um, some of the items that were looked at was the traffic, uh, not only at the interchange, but of caused by the project for the surrounding neighborhood, housing supply and the issues surrounding removing that R3, Greenhouse gas emissions, which is a new subject that CEQA mandates we address when we look at projects. And then also tribal cultural resources, which is also a new topic. Um, so this supplemental EIR was routed for public comment. We did receive uh, comments from a number of agencies. The most significant comment was from Caltrans and uh, that comment did take quite a bit of time and negotiation with Caltrans by not only the property owner, the applicant, our environmental consultant and ourselves uh, to essentially have Caltrans change their mind about what they had been indicating, which was that this project was uh, now seen as triggering the need for the interchange, which we felt was unreasonable. Unreasonable. Unreasonable, yes. Uh, so along with the uh, supplemental EIR, a mitigation monitoring and reporting program has been provided. Um, there was one uh, uh, impact which was deemed to be uh, significant and unavoidable. And in those situations, the council has the option of uh, making a statement of overriding consideration and staff recommends the council make that statement and that statement along with the mitigation monitoring plan and the CEQA findings are all part of the environmental resolution that has been provided to the council this evening. And speaking of the resolution, uh, we have a number of actions that the council is looking at taking this evening. Uh, first, as I mentioned, the environmental resolution and its associated documents. Uh, the second is a resolution amending the city's general plan land use map. The third is an, uh, an ordinance that the council will be introducing and then continuing to a future meeting to amend our city zoning map. The fourth is a resolution amending the specific plan land use provisions. And the final is an ordinance introduced to amend the specific plan zoning uh, provisions. Um, those are all provided to the council and that concludes staff's presentation. Uh, so if there's any question, I'd be happy to take Ms. that. Ms. Waterfield? Soon. Yeah, uh, Frank, uh, go over what, you, what kind of uh, statement you want the council to make in regards to what you were just. Certainly, uh, as I mentioned, the environmental report identified one potential impact that even though mitigations were applied, it still will be considered significant. In other words, the mitigations that are proposed aren't enough to bring it down to a level where there won't be any impact. And that has to do with operational air quality. So in other words, when the project is developed, uh, the operation of the project, the traffic, uh, whatever other mechanical devices are on the buildings and so forth, will result in excessive uh, air quality uh, emissions which will have an air quality impact um, and, and as I say those have been reduced by the mitigations included but not to a point where there is no impact therefore uh, sequest provides that a decision-making body can make this statement saying that even though there is this impact the value of the project to the community and the area 
is uh, more important than that one impact. Did we have to do that for the ENIS project? I do not know that uh, question or that answer. I'm not aware. Do you think so? The same, almost the same amount of acreage that was developed, mm -hmm. and yet we put a lot more people in there, both apartment-wise and shopping-wise and now school-wise. And So I'm just curious if that was something that we had to do there, too. I, I just don't know that answer. Did you know that, Ryan? Hmm. I, I don't think so, but then yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think so. I just wondered what triggered that. Yeah. True. Um, and for the council's information, we do have our environmental consultants from uh, RINCON, uh, Rich Dalton and Matt, Maddie Maggers, are available to answer more specific questions about this particular environmental document. Were they involved in the ENIS one? Do you know? Uh, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. Uh, Ms. Soto? Yeah, um, can you clarify for me um, if the um, significant impact, that is that just during the development phase? Is that even then after? Um, it, the impact is operational, so it's going to be from the operation of whatever gets developed on this site. I would like to just reiterate to the council that this project is only a land use and zoning change. We don't have a specific development plan at this point in time, um, but in order to analyze the project for CEQA, we had to make assumptions about what a reasonable development with that land use designation would be. And that's what these impacts and mitigations are based upon. That way, when future projects come to us, and they will require a plan development permit, um, if those projects don't exceed what those assumptions were in terms of the amount of development, the square footage, that sort of thing, there would be no need to do any further environmental work uh, when those future projects come to us. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, can you explain to me um, how if, if, if the changing, if this zoning change, how it will impact the development of the interchange project? My understanding from working with our engineering staff and also from the comments from Caltrans that we received is this change should not have any impact regarding the design or the construction of that interchange project. Uh, my understanding is that the final design of what that interchange might look like has not yet been decided, and that's going to be something that city staff will be working with Caltrans on. Um, however, the, the 1994 specific plan established open space, and if I move back through the slides here. Uh, so the green um, within the yellow uh, polygon uh, to the north near the Broadway interchange, that green area was open space specifically designated and established to accommodate the future interchange. And uh, that open space boundary is going to be remaining the same. Uh, there's no changes, it's not reducing, there's no encroachment to that. Uh, so our conclusion is that it should not have any effect that the existing specific plan doesn't already have on that interchange. And my understanding is that there is none. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another, thank you. Go ahead. Um, my question is, um, so by, uh, by us um, voting on the zoning change, so that wouldn't have any impacts on the, again, the, the, interchange project like for instance I, I saw from the power from the presentation or from what was on our binder that it went straight into Seaward Avenue Correct. and so do we have any say on that by as we're looking at the zoning change um, the the alignment of Seaward and the idea that Seaward would eventually connect to Broadway is not only it was part of the original 1994 specific plan document, and it's also part of our circulation element, um, our city circulation element. That's where that idea got established. It's 
truly independent of this project. Uh, this project, like any other development, will, um, when it comes for actual physical development, will it be charged fees that help uh, contribute to the funding of those projects. But this project itself is not driving that interchange, and it's not driving the design, and it's not driving the extension of Seaward, uh, particularly the idea that it would cross the freeway onto Broadway. Uh, that's going to be an independent project uh, subject to the review uh, through Caltrans and work between our engineering division and Caltrans. Thank you. We do. We do have some uh, slides that show the concept. Um, oops. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me see if I can get it back for you. Okay. Was it toward the end? Yeah. Oh. These are concepts that were um, part of um, earlier presentations and proposals to Caltrans. Yeah, also, that to do with this not necessarily, no. Yeah. It, oh. yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so yes, on the Enos, Ryan's confirmed that there were actually four uh, class one impacts, which are the unavoidable impacts, where the council did uh, mm -hmm. make a finding uh, that the project had okay. more merits than the impacts. Okay, okay. so Thank you. do we have the applicant here to speak? Lori Tamar is on the line with us. Okay. Lori, are you there? Remember? You're a little muffled. Can Hi, this is Lauren Samora with Urban Planning Concept. And uh, we appreciate the presentation that Frank Albro put together for this project. Uh, we've been working with him for about two years now through the environmental review process as well as um, the specific plan process. And uh, we understand that this project um, has going all into still allows for the potential of residential units as part of the new use project. And that is moving forward until we understand uh, the actual design of the Broadway 101 interchange and the connection to the Seaway Drive. Uh, what we Excuse me, Lori. Lori. Lori, you are sort of muffled, and so it's you're not coming across real clear. Okay. So I just want to thank you for and his work on this project, and we do not have any comments other than to respond to any questions that the city council may have. Any questions of Mr. Burr? Yeah. I, um, I have. I, go I, ahead, go ahead, Ms. Soto. Thank you. I, in regards to the air quality um, concerns, um, are we, or how are we planning to mitigate that? And I know that we don't have um, a specific project in front of us to, to approve, but um, are we going to be promoting? more transit services, um, alternative transportation. Um, how is the quality of life for the residents in the northeast side of town going to be affected, um, especially when we're talking about um, air quality? And again, how are we mitigating that? And is there any way that we would be able to, um, as projects are coming before us, ensure that, again, transit services are um, are better in that part of town and also encouraging alternative transportation that doesn't include getting into the car. Thank you, Council Member. Yes, the um, air quality mitigations that are included um, are in the mitigation monitoring plan and they are multifaceted. So, uh, one 
uh, of the major components is a traffic demand management plan. Um, and that plan will include um, pedestrian design of sidewalks and pathways, um, particularly through the parking lots, um, placement of park parking lots and building entrances so they enhance pedestrian travel, um, bicycle facilities including storage lockers, um, in shower, employee shower facilities, locker facilities, uh, transit support including um, transit passes or subsidies for, uh, for retail employees, um, charging stations, van pool stations, carpool stations, and uh, the encouragement of on-site services such as child care, postal machines, a good mix of commercial uses uh, to uh, uh, reduce travel and reduce vehicle miles traveled. Um, one other thing I should mention that part of this proposal includes by changing the, the full area to a C2 zone uh, that allows future applicants to apply for mixed use on that C2 property. And so there is the potential that residential could be part of this development um, where the freeway service zone, you cannot use the mixed use ordinance for that zone. Uh, there's some other um, air quality um, provisions in the mitigations, um, including greenhouse gas reductions, which goes to green building practices and uh, low energy use, you know, equipment and materials um, and so forth. That will also aid with the reduction of the air quality impacts. But as we've mentioned, not to a point where they're no longer significant. Thank you. Um, another question that I have in regards to the housing, and I know that Nurse Tamora um, um, alluded to this. Um, in the existing development potential plan that we have, it, if I understand this correctly, we have the capability of developing 102 high density units. And with the proposed development potential plan, we have the, there's an ability to develop up to 420 density units through mixed code use. Where did we find the space for all of those additional high density units? So that's a theoretical number based on the square footage of commercial that was assumed for the environmental analysis. And looking at the mixed use code, uh, this site, because of its location, has to have at least 50% of the floor area used for the commercial, the base use. Therefore, the 49% of the floor area could be residential. So just a quick calculation based off of a, a moderately sized apartment unit led to that number. I'm not, we're not saying that that will happen, but it's um, a possibility that uh, is enabled by the change in this specific plan. And so as development projects are coming our way, that's something that we will have to keep in mind, correct? That could be kept in mind. Uh, these development projects would be submitting a plan development permit application. Uh, there would be no requirement that there be residential on this property. It's just the opportunity that residential could be developed on this site. And that's a concern that I have. I mean, given that we are seeing housing shortages across the state of California, the fact that there is no guarantee that whether it's the current council at that time when they're reviewing these projects, um, that what if they, I mean, I guess my concern is that there isn't, there won't be a requirement from, uh, of developers to ensure mixed use. So, there's no guarantee that we're really going to be able to mitigate the impacts to housing. Well, the, the other aspect of this is that um, even with an R3 designation, there's no guarantee that that property would be used for housing. Um, the other component of that is that through our housing element, we are required to identify available sites for development. And this particular parcel, because of its 
One, because of its shape and its location adjacent to the levy. Um, essentially, state law did not even permit us to include that in our available sites. So that is one other reason why this project uh, was supported by staff because it didn't result in a, in a reduction of our housing element available sites and our efforts to meet our arena, our housing needs allotment. Um, but yes, you're correct. There is no mandate that mixed use happen on this site and that residential occur on this site. Dr. Motz. Yeah, Ms. Carl, I had uh, two questions. When we're talking about putting housing in here, we're talking about apartments on the second floor and commercial on the first floor? There is no requirement in our mixed use ordinance that mixed use be uh, vertical. It can be horizontal. Um, I believe most, if not all, of the mixed use ordinance projects that we've seen have been horizontal, where you have uses adjacent to each other, not on top of each other. Um, it's an option open to future developers and, and property owners how they would like to see that. So there could be some freestanding single family homes mixed in here? Uh, I believe, well, let me, I'm not certain that the single family residential, uh, it can be applied to the C2 as a mixed use. Or duplexes but or apartment complexes. Correct, medium density and high density Yes, that would be a possibility. Okay, my second question is, uh, if the original plan, you had residential backing up to the pre-existing residential, right. and now we're going to switch that to commercial. What are the consequences of having 18 wheelers rolling behind those pre-existing homes to service the commercial enterprises that would be going in, or other uh, unpleasant consequences of commercial zoning? The current specific plan includes requirements for buffering um, adjacent to the commercial uses um, in terms of landscaping, setbacks, and that sort of thing. Additionally, um, each project that comes to the city uh, will be subject to a plan development permit. Uh, if there are impacts that are identified as um, causing adverse impacts to those adjacent residential units, that's an opportunity where CEQA state law says we can reopen the environmental analysis and uh, look to see if there are impacts and if there are add further mitigations. Uh, or Conversely, an applicant can propose a project with adequate buffering, adequate separation, not putting a dry aisle or a supply dry aisle adjacent to the residential and configuring it in such a way to where the residential gets the lowest impact exposure uh, possible. It's up to the applicant to propose a plan to us and we have the ability through the plan development permit process to uh, deny if we think it's going to be an adverse impact or request changes through conditions. That was a really good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Soto? Um, how will the zoning change impact um, the Senate bill that we just learned about during um, our study session last week, 743? SB 743. Vehicle miles traveled. Um, that is because we had started this project so much earlier. Uh, this environmental study touches on vehicles miles traveled, but still uses the city standard of LOS to determine traffic impacts. Again, if in the future when an actual development project comes to us and there's something so significant about potential impacts, particularly if it's deals with vehicle miles traveled, there's always the opportunity the city can request additional environmental analysis. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any requests to speak or written correspondence? No, Madam Mayor, we do not. Okay. Any other questions, Mayor? Any other questions of Ms. Tamura? Thank you, Mr. Albro. Thank you. I just oh. thought of one. 
what's the a status update on the interchange plan? Uh, the most recent information I've heard from engineering is that uh, we have contracted with a firm to help us begin the design of that interchange and that negotiations and meetings with Caltrans staff will be beginning soon, but I'm not sure what time frame soon indicates. I believe within the next year. And so essentially like once that interchange plan or that interchange plan is in place, that's when projects will possibly be coming our way. Possibly, and, and um, one of the things that Lori had mentioned um, during her brief um, statement was that this project is required to um, not develop until the interchange is under construction and we know what we have. Our staff's opinion is it's very unlikely any commercial developer will come to the site until that interchange is available. Otherwise, the site won't have the necessary uh, ingress, egress for customers to visit the site. Uh, we think it's not, um, it's something that's going to just happen because of that, that developers will wait, uh, but we've included that kind of language in the documents and in the resolutions that um, those kind of developments, actual development of the land, will need to wait until that interchange is finalized and in process of being constructed. And Re remember Union Valley Parkway. The, yeah, the most recent uh, construction schedule for the interchange is to start construction in 2024. That could slip, though, with the additional planning and with COVID and everything else. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll bring this item back to the council for any further discussion and or a motion. I can go ahead and make a motion, but did we, do we have public comment? Did you ask for public comment? Yeah, I did already. Okay, okay. Um, shall I make it in all in one motion or do you want me to do, okay. <laughs> Great. I, th I think it would be better to have all three as, as separate motions, just in the event that somebody challenged any specific one. So, so do them individually then? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so all five of them individually. Okay, where do you where would you like me to insert the language in regard to the EIR? It's in there. It's in there. Okay, okay, fantastic. Okay, item number one. I'd like to make a motion to adopt a resolution certifying a supplemental environmental impact report, a statement of overriding considerations and a mitigation monitoring programs for the proposed project. Second. Okay, that's recommending, that's number one. That's number one, yeah. Okay, any further discussion? Madam Clark, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Moe? Aye. Councilmember Soto? Sorry. Um, can we discuss really quick? I'm sorry. Is, is it we, too late? Have, we have a motion already, and uh, we have a motion and a second. So we can discuss the motion that's in place. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I think my, and maybe you all can help me think this through. Um, I'm, I'm just, I, I keep thinking about how this is going to impact the quality of life for the residents on the northeast side. I mean, on one hand, I'm like, great, you know, it's like a food desert in that part of town. There's, it's hard for them to go to the grocery store without getting in their cars and driving across, you know, the overpass on Donovan. Um, but at the same time, I wonder how that's going to impact traffic flow once even that interchange is there onto Seward. And I mean, I mean, from what I'm hearing, the interchange is completely independent from the zoning. So really, I mean, I can't really do much about that. Um, do you think that maybe the interchange would have a better traffic flow going to the freeway for them as opposed of going through? It would take traffic out of the neighborhoods of getting to Donovan and then having to go on to either Broadway or to uh, the 101. It'd just be a straight shot for Seaward. You're, you're right, taking right. a lot of and cars I, off. 
and I yeah, and I hear your point of like traffic flow and better for connectivity, mm -hmm. right? um, connectivity from that part of town. Because you have a neighborhood that has smaller streets, and so you're actually taking cars off the off the street for them as well. Unless they're going from like East Donovan and then needing to turn into for the CHP office and then having to go through that whole residential site. But then would it be worth it for them to go through there than just going through the overpass and taking the 101? You're talking hypotheticals here and there's not even a project. Right, right, um, right. I, I guess you can. We're <laughs> a absolutely. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I think there's a project that uh, would open up and add to the uh, flow of traffic, the ability for traffic to flow in and out of that area. Uh, I, I, admittedly, I think there, there could be more cars, but we would also have uh, more access and to adopt a resolution amending the general plan land use policy map designations on 7.5 acres of a 37.6 acre site from freeway service FS and high density residence HDR to community commercial CC land use classification. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Mullins? Aye. Councilmember Soto? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Madam Mayor? Aye. Item no number three to make a motion, introduce an ordinance, and continue to a future meeting for second reading and adoption rezoning 7.5 acres of a 37.6 acre site from SPPDFS specific plan, planned development, freeway service, and SPPD. R3 specific plan, plan development high density resolution, re, residential to SPPDFC2 specific plan, plan development freeway tower overlay general commercial. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Moss? Aye. Council Member Cordero? Aye. Council Member Soto? Aye. Mayor Aye. Item number four, I'd like to uh, make a motion to adopt a resolution to amend the Rivergate Romer specific plan to be consistent with the amended general plan land use designation. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Moe? Aye. Council Member Cordero? Aye. Council Member Soto? Aye. And Madam Mayor Aye. And final motion, number five, introduce an ordinance and continue to a future meeting for second reading and adoption amending the Rivergate Romer specific plan to be consistent with the amended zoning designations. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Motz? Aye. Council Member Soto? Aye. Council Member Cordero? Aye. And Mayor Pizzino? Aye. Good evening, Council Member Cordero. Uh, well, I've been here. I just. Uh, 
Well, that's the quietest you've ever been. You can figure out and make this thing worse for Oh, thank you. And next, we have a regular business item. Thank you, Mr. Albro. Appreciate it. We have a regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will review a framework for soliciting and selecting a development partner and proposal for the redevelopment of specific city-owned property in downtown Santa Maria and provide further direction to City and Chamber of Commerce staff. The staff report is being made by Community Development Director, Mr. Ng. No? Or is he under? He's here, okay. Yeah, thank you. Good. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, we are here to present to you a framework for soliciting and selecting development proposals on city-owned properties in downtown. The revitalization of the San Andreas downtown remains an important goal and priority. We have a vision for a vibrant downtown, one that, will, one that will produce more jobs and housing, but also be a destination with dining and public space amenities. As you may know, last year in 2019, issued a less formal notice of opportunity to inform developers of potential development opportunities on city-owned properties in downtown. This generated good discussions with interested parties, and based on the comments received, we believe we are in a position to issue a more refined and focused request for proposals. This has been a joint effort of city staff and the Chamber of Commerce. Glenn Morris, President and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, has prepared a presentation for tonight's meeting. And I will now turn the time over to Glenn. After the presentation, both Glenn and I will be available for questions. Mr. Morris. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, it's a pleasure again to be with you this evening. And uh, very excited to, to share with you uh, the information we're going to go over this evening. As Mr. Ng mentioned, uh, we've been working for a while now uh, to, to try to identify a, a methodology that would allow us to leverage city-owned assets to really jumpstart uh, the revitalization of downtown, increasing investment, jobs in our community, um, and, and achieving um, goals that the city has established. Uh, we'll skip this as just the, the, our agenda for the presentation, but let me just start, and Mr. A mentioned this already, the, the council over, over a number of years has invested significant time and treasure in identifying a vision and a desired outcome for the revitalization of our downtown core. Uh, the purpose of our presentation this evening uh, and, and really this process that we'd like your um, agreement to move forward on is, is not to re-envision that, it's not to relitigate the um, intent or the, the potential for downtown but really rather to figure out how we actually activate and implement the division that you and the community have set forward um, over the last several years um, through the downtown specific plan, uh, the streetscape um, plan that it was developed a couple of years ago, um, and as most as recently as your um, um, goal setting session in uh, this last, what was it, in February? Um, seems like a lifetime ago now, but uh, you know, as you look at what's in the downtown specific plan, um, but also in your in your council goals, um, there was a, a specific direction to finish the implementation. Um, and so that's what we're here to do this evening. We talk about the assets that the city owns that could be leveraged to, to, to jumpstart this development. Specifically, um, we are talking about five parcels in the downtown owned by the city um, that are currently... Um, underdeveloped and could um, could accommodate significantly more and higher and better uses. They are specifically the two parking areas on the east side of the uh, Follis building, directly uh, between the Follis building and Broadway. Um, so those are the items number one and two on your map. Uh, number three is the Central Plaza or Pearlman Park. Uh, which is on the northeast corner of the intersection of Broadway and Main. Section four is the southeast corner of that same intersection, and that's the small sunken plaza that is directly to the north of the Bank of America building. And then number five is a small parcel um, on the northeast corner of Church and Lincoln, 
Um, it's the far eastern edge of the parking lot where the community development building sits uh, and directly across from the Heritage Square building and the Maya uh, restaurant. So those are the five pieces of land that the city owns um, right in the heart of downtown that we believe um, are ripe for development and could be leveraged uh, to partner with a developer and, and really jumpstart um, activity in our downtown. In addition to the land, the city does have other tools and incentives that it can bring. Uh, many of these are already envisioned in the downtown specific plan. Uh, they were anticipated by the council when that plan was adopted. Um, and you know they have been um, supplemented in recent years by the fact that most four of those five parcels, all but the Pearlman Park site, are, um, are within the federally designated opportunity zone, which adds some additional incentives for investors. Um, and so there are some additional tools that we can bring to the table, um, but really the land is, is the key that really makes this um, interesting and, and possible. About a year, maybe a year and a half ago, the chamber and the city staff uh, began circulating what we called a notice of opportunity. This was essentially a marketing exercise to try to identify uh, potential interest on the part of developers and find out whether um, they might have some interest in working with the city to develop these parcels. Through that process, we identified a number of different developers that expressed interest. Um, many of them, though, indicated that in order to move forward, they needed further clarification around what the city's expectations might be, what the process would be that they would go through, and a timeline for making decisions. So that's really what we're here today to do is to, to answer some of those questions. For following that, assuming that we get a positive response from you folks, um, we would then move to the distribution of a formal RFP process, which would be circulated through the development community, through the city and the chamber's um, channels to formally request that developers express interest um, in, uh, in working with us on these par one or more of these parcels. That response would require them to define a project description and provide a concept plan. It would ask for them to describe the economic impact and how the project would match with city priorities and goals. It would ask them to demonstrate their capacity to finance, market, and complete the project. And it would ask them to demonstrate their readiness and the ability to begin the project within a determined time frame. One of our goals in this process is not simply to um, start yet another multi-year planning exercise, but to get something coming out of the ground as fast as is feasibly possible. We're recommending a timeline that looks like what you see on the screen. Um, if, if we're successful in, in, in meeting your uh, approval, uh, later this summer we would begin to distribute that um, opportunity. We would ask that they would submit their proposals within about a two-month window. Uh, we would use about a month after that to review and, um, and, sc and score the, the different proposals that, that would um, be submitted. Um, that would then go back to the uh, downtown committee uh, for their um, review and analysis and ultimately a recommendation that we believe could come back to the council uh, in the first quarter of 2021. Um, to begin the process um, of, of identifying that project and, and the partner. Uh, I, I think it's important here to just point out that at that point you would be, uh, you would essentially be asked to um, approve the designation of a partner and the conditions under which the land, the parcel or parcels that they would want to develop would transfer from the city to the project. Um, it would not at that point um, actually approve a final project, but it, that would be the beginning of the, the planning process that they would go through, the, like any other project that would have to go through the planning commission and, and back to the council. So um, really what we're talking about with this first phase of the process is, is identifying a preferred partner and the conditions under which the land would transfer from the city um, to, the, to the project. Excuse me, Ms. Waterfield has a question. Yes. I have a question. Uh, and what just triggered me, you said the UE would transfer the land to the project. Explain what that means. Well, so that's what we're going to talk about now is how that would do, how that would okay. happen. But ultimately, um, the intent would be either through a sale or a lease of the land 
um, that the developer would gain control of the land and have the ability to then build on it. But the there wouldn't be there should be provisions that the developer cannot sell the land if he gets control of the land. And, and all of that's in in, in the conditions okay. that would be negotiated, and um, you would then approve when that project um, recommendation came back to the council. So how would we evaluate the projects that come forward, right? So um, if we're successful in this exercise, we would anticipate having multiple projects to consider. Um, and we would go through a review process that would evaluate these kinds of areas. So first would be the fiscal benefits to the city. If the city is going to give up an asset, which it owns and controls today, namely the, the, the parcel of land, um, it ought to do so in a way that, transfer, that, that returns financial fiscal benefits to the city. Um, some of those we believe would come in the form of increased uh, ongoing revenues to the city in the form of, of, of additional sales and use taxes. Um, the properties would, would return to the tax roll because as the, if, they were, if they were transferred to a private ownership. So there would be property tax receipts that would come forward. Um, and the reality as you all talked about uh, in your budget discussions a month or so ago, um, those project parcels today cost you money. You spend money every year uh, to maintain, um, repair, light, secure, um, manage those pieces of land. Um, <clears throat> that would come off of your books and would go on to the, um, the project developers' looks. We would also look to benefits to the community, right? So it's not just about making a little bit of a financial transaction, but we would want to see that there were benefits to the overall community as anticipated and, and hoped for in the downtown specific plan. Um, some of the things we would be looking for would be um, increased jobs, whether that's through um, retail or office projects that would come in as part of the development, um, as well as the construction jobs that would happen during the, the actual development, uh, the, the potential for housing in the downtown, um, the overall attractiveness of the community and how our downtown is perceived, um, and the ability to, uh, on the part of the developer, to support and partner with existing um, uses and, and, and programs in the community um, in, in a way that, that really adds to the whole. Um, we would also be evaluating um, the track record and capacity of the developer. As we said earlier, um, we're not interested in having somebody um, do a project on paper that never actually gets built. So one of the things that we would task the review team to do would be to really look at, do they have a track record? Um, is this a developer that gets things uh, built out of the ground? Once that kind of process is reviewed and there's a, a scoring mechanism that I'll show you kind of a, a, an initial concept for in just a moment. Once that is done uh, and there's a, you know, kind of a clear preferred partner, um, then we would look at what would the, the, the conditions um, be that would, that, that would make that transfer happen, right? So some of that is the pricing considerations, um, but then there might be others, similar, some of which may be um, the point that Council Member Waterfield brought up about um, how that transfer is done. Are there clawback opportunities for the city if, if, they're, if the project doesn't perform? Um, are there restrictions on the deed about, you know, transferring it out and just flipping the land to somebody else. Um, all of those kind of conditions would be negotiated um, with that preferred partner. Um, the pricing conditions, I think it's important to recognize that we have, um, we have had the parcels appraised, so we know what their current market value is, um, or at least we knew what it was pre-COVID. We'll assume that it hasn't changed much. Um, but we have a starting point based on an appraisal that was done um, a year ago and then through that review process, there would be uh, points essentially assigned by the review team um, for the direct financial benefits to the city, as well as points for achieving the goals that the city has identified. And those points would transfer, translate into uh, potential reductions from that kind of retail price, uh, turning this into a true incentive opportunity uh, for the city. So what are the next steps that we would go through? So what we've done so far is we've, we've got the, the, we've been working on this package and presentation. We have shared this with the downtown committee and they have given us feedback and recommended that we move forward and bring this to you. Um, so tonight we're here at the, with, to share this information with the city council and get your feedback and direction. Um, 
following that, we would anticipate moving forward um, with the, the distribution of this opportunity to the development community. I mentioned that there's a review panel, if you will, a scoring team that would be um, impaneled to review those proposals and, and assign the scores and help determine who the city wants to work with. Um, we're recommending that that panel include uh, the current four members of the downtown committee. Um, in order to get some expertise on that from the development side, we would um, recommend adding four um, scores from our Economic Development Commission. Uh, and then there would be f um, several of your senior executive team that would be asked to do that from the staff perspective as well. Those folks would then, um, using a form that looks um, something similar to what you see on the screen, would go through the, the proposals and actually score them. Um, those scores would then translate into an ultimately a recommendation um, and, and uh, a, a model that would help to determine the pricing um, and other conditions uh, under which the, the land would be made available to uh, the developer to complete the project. With that, Mayor, I would stop and answer any questions that you or members of the council may have. Any questions of the council? Ms. Soto? Yeah, um, Mr. Morris, can you go back to the, that, the, the fault, that, who owed that one? The one who's going to be part of the committee, the scoring I'm sorry, committee? I'm sorry, The scoring committee? Oh, uh, yeah, right there. Okay. Thank you. That, that was it. I just wanted to take it. I missed that. <laughs> Dr. Mose. Yeah, Mr. Morris, I'm kind of curious as to what you think would be good for the city. We're we talking about uh, two-story buildings, three-story buildings. We're we talking about commercial or residential or mixed use. Uh, what do you envision would be good? Well, your downtown specific plan envisions all of those. Um, and, and I think that, you know, again, as I said, we're, we're not here to try to... Um, to draw a new picture. I think the community has done great work in identifying what it wants. It's in that plan. What we're trying to do is figure out how do we get somebody to come in and build it for us. So all of the things that you just talked about are what is anticipated and called for in the downtown specific plan. Ms. Waterfield. Um, so say we have a developer that comes in and says this is something that I am interested in what would be our incentive to tell him that he would you know take a good hard look at it this is what we have to offer how would that conversation go so yeah that, that's exactly the conversation we want to have right so we're gonna put this out and say the city is interested in finding a partner and what the city can bring to that partnership really the, the real asset is the land Right, um, you you own outright and control some very key parcels of land, and and so that's the offer, right? If you have the right idea, the city's willing to put some land into the deal and 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 build a partnership, right? They would then have to come back to the city and say, in exchange for that land, here's what we think we could build uh, and, and and bring to the community, and then that review process would happen, and and you know. What is that? About 13 different leaders in the community would have to go through and score that and, 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 and say, yeah, we think this one, uh, maybe there's three, right? We think this of the three is the one that best achieves the goals we've set as a community uh, and brings the best overall package to the community. They would then recommend that that be our partner moving forward. Tom's team would then get involved in negotiating a contract that would, that would have all of those conditions that would be identified, um, you know, that, that would have to be met, all of the uh, performance measures, all of those kinds of things would get negotiated, and then that whole package would come back to the city council. Okay. And this group would have, to, would have the final say about, yes, we're going to move forward, or... Okay. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we investigate a developer? to make sure that they are on the up and up, because we're talking city property that we would be negotiating with it. And yeah, so, so you're asking about the uh, council member uh, Waterfield through the mayor. So you're, yeah, you're asking about the particular uh, scoring criteria 
Well, and not 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 the sc scoring criteria, well, but how do we investigate yeah. a developer before we even you know do we do that before we get into the scoring yeah. part of it? Because if you know if they're not worthy of it, then we just wasted our time yeah, so scoring when we, them. When we look at it, it'll be to your first question earlier. Um, some of the criteria are: does it generate taxes, sales tax, property tax? Does it reduce our ongoing cost burden? So that's more money to the taxpayers. And then does it further the goals of the downtown specific plan? So those are key things that we'll be able to tell the residents that it's in the city's interest to partner with this particular developer. And that's, they're going to be ranked differently. Some of them might generate a whole lot of hotel tax. Some of them might generate a whole lot of property tax. Some might have more parks or open space or whatever. And so those will all be things that we can weigh. Um, and then one of the criteria is to look at does the developer have a decent track record is mm -hmm. are that's they what i want to know doing it and so there'll be a cursory view at that point of how do we do that what does that process look like who does it and is it more than one person mm -hmm. doing that yeah. madam, madam mayor if i if i may um, you know with respect to a multi-million dollar development the players who would be capable of doing this are going to be readily available and readily vettable based on regular uh, opportunities where have they built projects what has been the experience by others what has been the experience by those government agencies have they performed as necessary do they have the financial wherewithal and they will have to release certain documents and trade elements to and that's us so that and we that's what we would that. assume that's exactly what we would assume out well, of we a developer. won't be assuming it if we're partnering with them it will be part of the vetting process for them to proceed and yeah. my expectation would be between the finance director myself and other experienced uh, professionals that are directors here we have not only the context but the obligation to perform that before that is even mm -hmm. brought forward as a project because that's to me, and I had this discussion with Mr. Morris and the other members of the team, the financial ability and the construction capability of, an, uh, of a partner is paramount because, to answer your question earlier, we would have a clawback provision on the land, but we don't want it back. We want the project built. So the whole point is to come out of this with a proposal that f dovetails the community's needs, the ability of the developer to create it and get a return on investment and bring that to council for an ultimate decision. Okay, and you say all the right things, but I just don't want to assume because what we did last time, we assumed and we got phallus. And we had all the financials, everything in order, and everything looked good on paper, but when it came to actuality, you see what we have. Well, and, and a so I want, I want to make sure. The project itself. Pardon me? I said there's a difference between anchor tenants and the project itself, and we would be looking at that too. Perfect, perfect. Oh, I, no I think. Oh, yes. Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I, I, this is being discussed as if it were a new uh, concept. Um, as I recall, this was part of the original concept when the when the mall on the east side went in, and the uh, the actual the bridge that's been negatively referred to as the bridge to nowhere was actually created so that those two uh, east and west mall structures could be uh, uh, connected, and you could go from one side of Broadway. Uh, to the other without getting onto the roadway. So this is really not new. This is a resurrection of councils of many, many years ago. And uh, I think all of Ms. Waterfield's questions uh, are valid and, and, and should be answered. But uh, I, I, I don't think you're going to get someone in here that is going to be a fly by night person. Uh, I, I, for instance, I just to, if Bass Pro decided that they wanted to put a store there, uh, their name kind of says who they are and, uh, and what their capabilities are. Whereas if you get, you know, Roscoe's Economy Services, uh, they're not going to be able to get in. So I, th I think that this discussion is a bit premature until we have somebody to, to discuss. 
And when that comes, then we all have the opportunity to turn that down and and uh, and really uh, focus in and narrow in on on the questions that uh, that Councilwoman Waterfield is is focused on, which I think are valid. Mr. Cardero, I absolutely agree with you, but I think it's important to get these things out right now because we were deceived, um, to put it bluntly or lightly, but if you look across the street at the mall, and that was sold as the panacea, and there were people in this town that, a lot of people in this town that didn't want it. Uh, there were businesses that went into the mall at, with this partner. And if you can imagine being a business person and having to accept a partner because the people sitting up here said you're going to accept this person as a partner in business. And all those businesses went out. And I, and I think that, uh, I just think we, you know, I want to say it too because I know maybe it's premature, but I think people need to hear what we're thinking. And I just don't want to see us do, make that mistake again. And of course, we did own the parking structure that we finally paid off, what, two years ago? Uh, <clears throat> but um, I, I, I think it's important that people know how we feel about this and that we don't get sold a bill of goods and, and have buyer's remorse. Soto. I, I, agree. I agree with you, Mayor, but until we have someone to discuss, then, then uh, uh, I, I don't know what more we can say. I think that the council, uh, probably you're not going to get it put any better than uh, it was put by Councilperson uh, Waterfield, to, that we should be very concerned and with the history that uh, you have with the council and having done it, uh, I have the confidence that this council and the councils in the near future will will uh, will not allow anything like that to happen again. Miss, thank you, Miss Miss Soto. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor, um, and thank you for providing that um, context and that rich, interesting history of Santa Maria. Um, but um, I, th I think. To Councilmember Waterfield's point, um, I completely understand the concern of making sure that um, whenever we're talking about, you know, um, getting into negotiations with a partner and possibly selling or long-term leasing our land, it's definitely important to have all of those kinks worked out. And um, I really appreciated that in the planning process, it, it literally one of the points is that the developer demonstrates a track record and capacity for for these types of for, for developing in in our parcels. And so, um, I, I I think I would be um, interested to learn more about exactly what that process would look like to um, hopefully hopefully ease some of those concerns that Councilmember Waterfield and from what I hear other council members up here have. Um, but I, I will say that um, I, being part of the downtown specific committee along with Councilmember Waterfield and a couple of other commissioners has been a really interesting process. And um, after having so much community input for the downtown specific plan, I, I, I mean, one of the things that I've always said has been um, the city needs to be like the first one to invest in our downtown. And I think that this is, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that we are at least having these conversations about what the city is willing to put forward in order for us to start the downtown specific plan and see it come to fruition. Like we need to be able to say as a city, you know, we're willing to invest in our downtown as well. And here, here is our plan to do so. But again, really making sure that we have a clear understanding of how we're going to be able to ensure that the developers have uh, have the capacity um, as we're in these in these um, negotiations. Yeah, Ms. Soto, I, I think that you, you raise a great point. Many cities, I think, put out a, a vision and then hope somebody comes along and agrees with them and wants to do the work. Um, the city of Santa Maria is in a really unique position um, because for whatever reason, you became landowners. Um, and, and so you have that ability to incentivize and to be that first mover that demonstrates what can happen in the downtown. Uh, and, and I believe that if, if, if that's done well, um, that what you'll then see is you'll see people moving over and, and, and you know, either 
reinvesting in property they already own in the downtown, or somebody's going to want to acquire it so that they can, you know, get it up to speed and, and make some money on it as well. Um, Councilmember Waterfield, I think, you know, the what I would point out is, is you know, we're going to ask those very questions in the original submission. They're going to have to tell us this is what we've done. They're going to give us, con you know, references. <laughs> we're going to be able to see their, their track record. Um, and, and again, then there's multiple points at which decision makers, the downtown committee, the city staff, the council itself um, will have an ability to exercise your judgment uh, and, and to be able to say we, believe, we trust this one. We think that the homework that the staff have brought to us um, gives us that confidence. We believe in the vision and we're ready to move forward. Or you're not. And at that point, that would be a completely legitimate outcome is to say we went through the process and we didn't find what we were looking for and so let's do something different, right? But I think at least in this, uh, this gives us the opportunity to, to put something out there and, and see what we can bring uh, to the community and then let folks like you and Council Member Soto and the others on the downtown committee, um, you know, take your best shot at it and poke holes in it and, and see if it stands up to your standards. You know, I know what we always talk about because we've got 135 and 166, and I always tell people, if you ever get a chance to <clears throat> to drive through Clovis because they have a state highway, and I would never have thought that they could do what they did with their downtown, but um, they've certainly have slowed the traffic down, and they've got a lovely downtown, and even for a block or two out from the downtown, they've done a great job. Thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Motes. I just wanted to say one thing um, involving the Pearlman Park. I mean, you know, the Pearlmans were lifelong Santa Maria people and they taught at Santa Maria High School and the park's been memorialized after them. And so I think that uh, rather than just having their name fade into oblivion when it's in the commercial enterprise, the city should give some consideration to renaming something else after them. Something else after? After the Pearlmans. Maybe the next park that comes up for a, a name change or a plaza or something like that. Well, while we were talking, I, get, I did get a text from someone and said, please save Pearlman Park. So... So, so uh, I'm sure there's going to be some resistance out there. I just, that's, yes. So there's no motion. It's just a recommendation. No, just. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any requests to speak? No, Madam Mayor, we do not. Written correspondence? No. Okay, I'll bring this back to the council. Any further discussion and direction? I think staff probably heard us. Mm -hmm. I think so. Any other questions or anything? Good. Thank you. That was that was great. And and all of us want you know. I don't know how long I started going to those focus groups and and then all these the way people wanted the downtown to look was really really great and different people coming together even at the li at the library but we were meeting much much earlier than that and to see what, what people want. So I, th I think it's really neat. Thank you. So I'll bring the next item will be a report by city manager, Mr. Stillwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. The next meeting of the city council is August 4th and we'll have the second reading of the Rivergate Romer zoning amendment and specific plan ordinance. And uh, we have scheduled a presentation from pg e about wildlife wildfire safety plan and safety power shutoff program. So that's that program pg e has when there's a fire risk, they turn off the power. So we want to make sure the council and our community is aware of that policy and what their practice will be in the upcoming fire season. And we anticipate having an additional COVID update as this um, pandemic continues to evolve. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Oral reports of council members. Dr. Motes? No, Madam Mayor, I have no report. Thank you. Ms. Waterfield? I have no report. Ms. Soto? I, my, I think it's a report. Um, the Thursday, July 16th Planning Commission and City Council study session on SB 743. Um, Mr. Cordero? 
Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I uh, did the uh, Ben Hay show after the last council meeting. Uh, received another COVID test. It tested negative. And uh, I'll be uh, self-quarantining my uh, self and family for a while as I was around some people that uh, are not normally around. So uh, I'll be getting another COVID test in the near future to make sure that things are still there. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Mr. Cordero, you need to stay away from positive people. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, July 9th, I did the Breach 2020 Introduction and Action Plan Telemeeting, did the weekly meeting of key leaders, unifying the recovery efforts, telemeeting, and then the legislative briefing regarding the COVID. Did the Rick Blameyer Show to give out more information about what's going on in the city with COVID. On July 16th, I attended the SBCAG monthly board meeting and the weekly meeting of key leaders unifying recovery efforts and the Planning Commission Council study session on state law SB 743. Did the legislative briefing call on COVID telemeeting. July 17th, the legislative briefing with COVID telemeeting. It, after a while, they just all blur together. Um, and that uh, early, late morning, uh, Ms. Waterfield and I did the honoring the hometown heroes on South College Drive. What so a great, that, that was so great. Um, uh, oh, on July 18th, I went to the Boys and Girls Club and um, Gloria Molina, for, that was supervisor down in, in Los Angeles, came up and she and a group of women um, in the Los Angeles area make all these masks and they brought up a bunch of masks for the kids of the Boys and Girls Club and they made children's masks as well as adult masks and they were really really nice and it was so it was just so nice that they did that uh, she has a sister that lives here in Santa Maria and so they the three of them came over and brought the masks over to the Boys and Girls Club Did you get one? I didn't get one. I was. I felt like a little selfish to get a mask when other people could use it. Um, and let's see. I went to the Paul Nelson opening yesterday, and it was today instead. I know they opened yes. I mean, they didn't. Open they didn't. They opened today. But but it, it wasn't that I got my, I got my um, my calendar wrong. It was that the um, something was was wrong with the pumps and the uh, anyway. It was a technical problem, and um, and I guess that is it. Any other comments from? Speaking of calendars, yes. The Outlook calendar is just horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying. I've got two calendars now that I'm trying to handle, and so it's just back and forth. But I talked to James and said there's nothing to do about it. Yeah. It's just something we have to get used to. Okay. If there's nothing else for the council, this meeting is adjourned.